Let's build a bare metal Hello World application in C for the RISC-V architecture. Code for this project is in the description. I'll open a new file called hello.c. I'll define the base address for the UART and how I determine what this base address is, is uh, I discussed that in a prior assembly language video, which you can watch in the card uh, in the upper right hand of the screen. Now I'm going to implement flow control for the UART, which I didn't do in the assembly language video. Um, but um, in order to do that, we're going to need to look, take a look at a data sheet for the 16550 UART. So I'll put a little uh, link to that here. So let's have a look at this data sheet. In order to implement basic flow control, uh, there's a couple of registers to look at and look for. And this is uh, this is the TI data sheet. It's page, it's page 33. It's funny that it's in the middle, that this one little diagram is in the middle of the document because it really tells you everything. Um, so we need to enable first the FIFO control register um, because I, I do not believe it's enabled by default. And the way you do that is to this bit zero of register two. Um, you, you set that to one. So FIFO enable to one, um, to this to two register. Um, you'll note that the transmit holding register itself, when you write data to the UART, is basically register zero. And that's why at one, zero, 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 that's the location in memory that you actually write the characters to because that's the register in the UART where you, where you do that. And then the, the second register from that offset uh, or, or sorry, register two, it would be zero, it would be the, the first, second, the third register, but um, since it's zero base register two, you write a one to enable the FIFO. And then to determine whether the FIFO is empty or ready for another character, if you look at this fifth register here, or register five, the line status register, down here in bit five, the transmit holding register, uh, I can't highlight it, sorry, this one, this one right here, that's the register that'll tell you whether it's empty. If it's a one, uh, it's empty and it's ready to ready to accept data. And so given that this is bit five, this should be um, bit, if, if we identify this bit in code, this would be 20 hex. Let's create a macro to make it easy to access hardware registers. It'll dereference a pointer to a volatile unsigned character located at the memory address calculated as the sum of the base uh, and the uh, offset. And then I want to define three registers. I want to define data register for writing data. And then I want to define a FIFO control register so that we can determine or so that we can enable um, FIFO control. And then uh, I want to uh, access a line status register so that we can determine whether the FIFO is ready to receive data or not. We need to define some bits too. Let's, put, let's define the bit constants that we'll use to interrogate these registers with. Uh, this FIFO control register enable bit is gonna be needed. And um, we're gonna also need the line status register, um, uh, what is this? The transmit hold, yeah, that's right. The transmit hold register empty bit. So now let's define a convenience macro to check whether the FIFO is empty. And we're basically just going to and those two together. We're going to and, and the, what we get back from the line status register, we're going to and that um, with the line status transmit hold register empty bit. So now let's create a function that puts a character to the transmit FIFO when it's ready to accept it. So I'll pull the FIFO in a while loop, waiting until it's empty. And again, this is polling. You could use interrupts. It's more complicated. It's not really necessary here, so that's why I didn't do it. And then we just set the data register with the value of the character. So I create a function to put a string to the UART by calling the function we just created in a loop. So 
So we're going to loop over uh, each value of the string and we'll stop when it's when we hit a zero or a null. And then we'll call put C and we'll send the string or the character and then we'll advance the pointer to the character. So now we'll create our main function. And this function is fairly simple. We're going to enable the FIFO control register. And then we'll call our put string function and we'll send hello world to it. And then we're going to need to end the program and we're just going to loop forever because there's no operating system to return to. So I'll create a linker script. We'll call it baremetal.ld. So I'm going to set the starting address first. Uh, this will be the starting address in memory that we want our uh, program or, or code to live at because when QEMU starts up, this is the address that the pro after the processor comes out of reset that the program counter is going to get set to. And again, I explain how I knew that in the uh, assembly language video that I, that I referenced earlier. And so now we're going to um, put our text section here. So all the code section is text. We'll get stuck here starting at 8000000. So uh, the next thing that I'm going to do here is I'm going to put in a directive to prevent the linker from trying to optimize sections together because the text section is supposed to be defined as read x, read execute. And the sections that follow, like the data section, is supposed to be read-write. And sometimes the linker will try to optimize those together. This will prevent that from, from happening. And you'll get, if you don't do this, you'll get some kind of error um, related to the text section being executable. I mean, I imagine some operating systems may actually refuse to run. I'm, I'm not 100% sure. Since we're writing bare metal, it doesn't really matter. It's just a warning. It's an annoying warning that makes you think something's wrong. So this prevents that annoying warning. Okay, so now we're going to put the data section. Now, recognize here that um, since we're running the GCC compiler, that compiler can generate a bunch of different sections. And, you know, it's one thing when you're coding assembler, you have control over exactly what sections you're going to put various things in. So when you write the linker script, you're going to know what sections you need to, to cover for. Um, GCC can write a bunch of them. I don't know what they all are. Um, but in the description, I reference a blog that I find found very, very helpful in, in producing this video that shows you how to produce basically a foolproof linker script if you're going to write, you know, any sort of bare metal C. This script that I'm writing here is eventually going to work for this little example, but if you wrote a large C application, it probably it most definitely would not work because it's missing a bunch of the sections um, that GCC would, e would emit. Um, but if you read the blog, um, the, the author goes through very detailed description on how to create a full sort of a, a foolproof linker script. So it's worth your time if you're doing this work. I just wanted to produce the simplest thing that could work. And so um, that's what I've done here. So let's put together a make file to build and run the application. Uh, the default is going to be building the binary, hello.elf. And then we're going to run the compiler to produce the object file, and it's going to depend on the C file. So we're going to run the compiler, and we're going to pass the C flag, which means generate an object file. And then we're going to pass the G flag, and, uh, which means produce symbols. We're going to pass the O0 to not optimize anything. We're going to pass freestanding to make sure the compiler knows that we're producing a bare metal application, so no standard library, no start files, no, no nothing, basically. 
Um, we're going to specify the RIS-35 base architecture with the Arch and ABI flags. And then we're going to output the O file and input the C file. Okay, so next we're going to um, build the binary and um, we're going to depend, it's going to depend upon the object file and it's going to depend on the linker script. So we're going to call the linker. We're going to specify minus T and feed the linker script in. And then we need to tell the linker what architecture we're going to build this binary for, which again is uh, RIS-3532 base. We're going to output the ELF and we're going to take in the object file. So now I'm going to run, uh, put, put in an option to run the binary. And uh, I've put a little text here to tell you how to stop QEMU because that's what I'm about to run in case you don't know because it doesn't really tell you on the console. And then I'm going to run QEMU and we're going to tell it, um, you know, it's an emulator. We're going to, it emulates a RIS-35 system. We're going to tell it not to display a graphic window because I don't want to see it. And we're going to tell it to also, with this command, the serial command, redirect serial port to my host's terminal. And then we're going to run the machine called vert, which is a fake machine with a few peripherals like a serial port. And then we're going to send the BIOS flag with the binary that we built because we're basically going to fake out a BIOS. We're going to, we're going to treat our program like a BIOS, and BIOS is nothing but a program itself. Um, this sort of prevents any bootloader or anything from running. It just directly jumps to the 80000 address uh, after the machine comes out of, out of reset. And then let's do a little clean so we can clean our build artifacts if we want to. Okay, let's make and run this thing. And I don't see hello world. I don't think it worked. So let's stop this. Now let's, um, let's have a look at what our binary looks like. So uh, I'm going to use object dump. And that's going to produce a mixed source dump of both assembly and uh, our C code. So let's have a look at this. Uh, let's see. Where's our main? Uh, here, here's main. And okay, so our main, you know, as you'll recall, let's go back and have a look at our main. Um, it only does three things. We set the FIFO control register, we put stuff, and then we loop. So, so here we, yeah, so we set the FIFO control register, we write, and then we loop right here at the end. Um, it all looks fine, except one thing I've noticed is we're, we're dealing with the stack I created a data section, so I guess I just assumed that the stack would exist, but thinking more carefully about it makes sense that it doesn't, because again, we're not we're not loading a C runtime, there's no start files, there's no nothing, so we just come out of reset and jump to 8,000 and there's no stack. So this, this code right here, you know, I don't, we don't know what the stack pointer is set to. It's set to nothing or it's set to garbage or whatever, so... Um, and of course it's using the stack because we're calling functions. The ABI is going to use the stack to pass parameters. So, you know, without running the debugger, my, my guess is, is the stack pointer is munged up. So what we're going to need to do is we're going to need to allocate a stack, but of course, you know, we can't allocate a stack in main because that's, that's too late. So we need to build, um, uh, some kind of uh, bootstrap to do that. So let's create a start file. We'll call it start.s. So we'll code a little bit of assembler to um, allocate a stack. So it, it, you know, this needs to do really two things. It just, it needs to allocate a stack. It needs to set up the stack pointer to point to what that allocation is, that address of that allocation. And, um, 
and it's going to need to jump to main, right? Because it needs to start a program. Okay, so let's load the stack pointer with uh, a label. We'll call this label stack top. We're going to need to create data for it here in a second, which we'll do. Uh, we also need to set up the frame pointer because the frame pointer is used as a reference to uh, a given uh, stack frame whenever you're inside a function because the stack pointer um, in theory could change. So the stack frame is always gives you a reference for the state of the stack inside any given function. So we're basically setting it to the same location as the stack pointer um, to start off with. And then we jump to main. Okay, so we're gonna put in like another safeguard for looping forever in case main returns. It shouldn't, but this will, if, if main does return, this is a safety mechanism to make sure that we don't go run off into never, never land of memory. Okay, so now let's create some stack space. Now, there are a variety of sort of more complicated but efficient ways of doing this. Um, you know, this could go in the BSS section, um, which basically won't take up space in the actual binary. What I'm doing here is actually gonna take up space in the binary. Um, a lot of times too, the stack will go at the end of memory and grow, you know, toward the application. I'm just gonna create an arbitrary stack of say AK here, um, which is good enough for this applications, but you know, Anyway, just trying to keep things simple. Uh, one thing to note with the way RISC-V ABI works is um, it, that the ABI says that um, the stack should be allocated in the largest, uh, in units of the largest variable size, which for RISC-V Q type processor, which we're not running, but the Q type processor supports values up to 16 bytes in length. So um, I believe the GCC compiler is gonna emit, um, in fact, I think I remember seeing it, emitting stack allocations in chunks of 16 bytes. So we wanna make sure that this data area is, is aligned on 16 byte intervals um, to make, um, to minimize the number of pro uh, processor instructions required to get to the stack. And then obviously we need to define the label and the label um, is specified at the end of the space because again, the ABI specifies that the stack is supposed to grow downward. It, in theory, it could grow either direction, but by convention, uh, it grows top down. So I need to make some changes to the make file now to build start s. So we need to obviously um, assemble start s. We're gonna we're gonna um, build a start.o an object file based on start s, and we're gonna run the assembler to do that. And we're gonna specify the architecture again for risk 532i. We're gonna output the o file, and then take in the s file. And then we need to modify the linker to ingest the start.o so it links it together with our hello program. And then, yeah, we'll, uh, I'll also clean up the start.o as well. All right, so let's run this whole thing again, compile and run, and it still doesn't work. Hmm, okay, let's have a look again at the source and see if we can figure anything else out. So let's, so the thing is supposed to jump to 8,000. Uh, oh, that's interesting. 
That's interesting. 8,000 has our has our, our put C function. So, um, yeah, that would definitely not work right. We, uh, <laughs> we need start, uh, not even main. We need, we need this function to be loaded at 8,000. Okay. So that's fine. Uh, let's do that. Um, yeah, so let's um, let's go to start.s, and um, so what we're going to do is we're going to um, get control over ordering the text section um, by modifying the section name, and then we're going to um, cause the start code to appear in the layout by using this um, by using this keep directive. So we're going to reference the name of the section that we just changed here, which I believe should force that section to be put first. Okay, let's try this one more time. Oh, look at that. It worked. Hello, world. All right. So hit Control AC and quit. Okay, that does it. Uh, if you uh, like the video, like the work that I'm doing, please like and subscribe. It helps my channel out. Thanks for watching.